Welcome to episode six of the Everyday Sense podcast. I am Jack Richardson, joined by Brennan Parks on this Friday, May 12th. Uh, Brennan, how are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. We uh, When this comes out, we'll know if the Leafs won that game tonight. But for us, uh, for us, it's tonight. So uh, what's your prediction there? Honestly, I feel like we've recorded every single Leafs game day, at least in the second round, it feels like. Uh, maybe every Florida Panthers, because I know we recorded the day of game seven. But um, my prediction is it's going to be brooms out. I, I'm hoping for brooms out. Um, it, it would be, I think, the funniest kind of situation if the Leafs get swept and the headlines will be good. Sports radio will be great in Toronto. So that's what I'm hoping for. And that's what I think will happen. How about you? Yeah, uh, I would definitely want that to happen. I think they'll win at least one. I mean, it's hard to believe they'll they'll get swept. That would be utterly brutal for them, especially because Florida, even though they're playing well, they're not like a, a consensus powerhouse. Like they felt very beatable going into the playoffs. Um. I think the best thing to watch will be the changes that they're going to make if they do lose, though it's like the Twitter fans and everything, that's funny, but are they going to fire Keefe and Dubis? Are they going to trade players? I mean, they can't keep going like they are, so I mean, as much as we love the Sens, it's kind of entertaining to watch the Leafs crumble a little bit, so uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Listen, people can point out that we're talking about the Leafs too much, but it's an everyday Sens podcast and talking about the Sens means you got to talk about your biggest rival and that's the Toronto Maple Leafs. So we're hoping that they're swept. And by the time you're listening to this, it's been a couple of days, but uh, in the meantime, we've got some, some news to get into obviously on Monday uh, on Monday night, they had the NHL draft lottery and, you know, for the last few, few seasons, it hasn't been super intense for Sens fans. I think they've, you know, last year they were uh, seventh, but obviously the pick was to Chicago for Alex to it. So um, that didn't end up mattering, but um, it's been, it's been a, Three years of, of, you know, if it happens, we'll be like, okay, thank you. But not not, not something that's going to change the course of the rebuild um, if you get shafted in the draft lottery or anything. So I think I had that feeling on Monday night. Uh, what were your thoughts kind of going in? Like uh, the day of, I think I was starting to manifest a second overall pick to, to Ottawa. Yeah, a lot of people were. I was kind of shocked uh, on Twitter. Like everybody was talking about it. I think I was kind of busy that day and I, I didn't even realize. I was like, there's no, I mean, there's no excitement here. Ottawa's not getting a high pick. Um, but yeah, I go on Twitter. My entire feed is just Adam Fantilli jersey swaps and getting all excited. I'm like, my goodness, it really is the off season, isn't it? Um, for me, yeah. I mean, I did watch the lottery, and I'm not gonna lie. When they got to Buffalo's pick and Ottawa was supposed to be next, at first I thought that was supposed to be Ottawa's pick, and they pulled Buffalo, and I was like, I actually screamed. I was like, oh my god, they're moving up. And then it was like, no, they're supposed to get the 12th pick, so they did. Um, I mean, you can't be disappointed. Like, I mean, it was a long shot to ever move up, right? So. Definitely not disappointed. Um, I think more interestingly, and I wrote an article on it, but was Jacob Chikrin worth that package, right? Because now we know that that's the 12th pick and that's a top 15 pick for him, a top 15, top 10 pick for Debrinkit last summer. Ottawa's uh, losing out on a lot of draft capital here. What do you think about that? Yeah, certainly. We'll get into Chikrin in just a sec. I will say my highest stress during that draft lottery night was when Montreal was up. And I, oh. I, I just can't, couldn't stand the idea of Connor Bedard in Montreal, but obviously he's going to go over to Chicago now winning the first pick and we don't have to get into all that. But like you mentioned, the trade ended up being because the Ottawa Senators did not win the draft lottery, did not move up to first or second or third or fourth or fifth. Jacob Chikrin for the 12th overall pick, a second rounder and a third rounder um, in the future. So you asked the question and you wrote an article about it. Was he worth the 12th overall pick? And I'm going to start and I'm just going to say absolutely he was. I know under, I know it's a deep draft, uh, but this is, we said it when it when he was traded to Ottawa. Same with the Brinket. You use selections like this, hoping to develop a player into a Jacob Chikrin. So I think having him now for the timeline of this core, it's an absolute no brainer. I'd be I'd be stunned if any Sens fan out there is kind of saying that this trade alone wasn't worth it. We can have a different discussion about moving all the draft picks for players right now. That's a different topic. Um, but I think as a whole, this single trade absolutely was worth it. Ten times out of ten. Yeah, so Ottawa ended up moving the 12th pick in this year's draft, the uh, second round pick in 2024, and a second round pick, Washington's second round pick in 2026 um, for that. So I'm definitely on your side. I mean, again, you can check the article out for a full breakdown. I talked about not only Chikrin, but uh, Alex Dabrinkit too, and just they gave up six picks and, and a ton of draft capital for that. And uh, But yeah, I am certainly on the side that it was the right thing to do. Because like you said, what are the odds that a 12th overall player in this year's draft becomes a Chikrin or a Debrinket. Like we're talking about a 40 goal scorer and I'm talking about Debrinket too from last year, a 40 goal scorer or a guy that's received Norris trophy votes. The odds of that are so slim 
And not only that, but just becoming an everyday NHL player. A lot more prospects bust than they do actually make it and make a difference, right? It's kind of hit and miss with the draft. Um, bigger than that, though, is the contention window. And I think even if, say, theoretically, the 12th overall pick this year becomes a really good NHL player, whether they're at the level of Chikrin or not, it's going to be at least two or three years, probably even more, before they make the team, for one, and become that like actually good player. By the time they're a staple on, say, it's a, a second-line forward or a first-line forward or a, a top-pairing defenseman or a second-pairing defenseman, by the time that happens, Ottawa's going to be like halfway through their core contracts and on a very slim timeline to win. So, I don't know. For me, the Sens are entering that win-now mode where their window's opening and they really can't waste years you know, waiting for prospects to develop and stuff. Their core is in place. They knew they were missing a defenseman. They got the defenseman, and, and they're a lot better for it, and that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I, I, and like I said, I don't. I'd be shocked if anyone is kind of, you know, saying it was not worth it. Now, health wise, I don't think it's it's not fair to point at the player and be like you can't stay healthy all the time. But it it is a concern a little bit, and we'll, we'll get into that in the off season a little bit. But uh, it's just a no brainer for me. Like you can't you can't expect to compete. And I'm I'm very you know thankful for Dorian for doing this last summer in the last ten months even, and just just n- noticing that like we need to sell these assets that we've spent so much time acquiring and the fun part is they haven't traded away a big name prospect at all and they still have all this right so yeah we're talking about the timeline of the core and how old they are and all the all the guys under long-term contracts but the prospects that were drafted in 2018 19 20 who haven't really cracked the roster yet are still in the system and are still here in 2021 even with like a zaka stop and yeah i'll mention tyler boucher as well right like these are these are prospects that you still have in your system so you've just essentially traded like an extra future is what i like to think about it as right like th- this pick like you mentioned is not going to be in the lineup for the sends in probably three four years like look how long it took jake sanderson to get here it took him a year and a half two years essentially right to play in an nhl game and he's still that he's that good so imagine a 12th overall guy it'll take forever yeah, and like making the lineup is one thing too, but the majority of guys don't step in like Sanderson didn't be these elite contributors right away. Like the, he's going to be years away when he's hitting his prime. The current core is going to be exiting their prime and done. And so yeah, you want that you know rotation of players. And you look at like a Pittsburgh or a Boston or somebody who's been a contender, and there are a few teams who have been contenders for many years, right? They kind of like rotated through. Now Chicago is getting a little bit of it where they they just lost Kane and now they're getting Bedard, right? Some teams can do that, but you have to kind of like Tampa's sort of that way too. It's not common though. You know, you have to realize that there is a window and although, yeah, you could build and say, well, if you get this prospect, maybe in, you know, eight years or something, Ottawa could then continue being a really good team and they won't have to rebuild again. But that's just a long shot. Like you want to win now. You want to win with this core. You're committed to this core. You have to focus on the present. Like you said, though, the last line of my, uh, my article on it was actually that they accomplished the rare feat of acquiring not one but two young proven star players via trade and any opportunity to do so without losing a roster player or top prospect must be taken. Pierre Dorian capitalized on advantageous opportunities. So it's just a matter of like if you can just trade draft capital which again very hit and miss it's not like a Shane Pinto who you know is going to be at least a good NHL player. You're talking about players who you haven't even selected yet and they're they're years away they're complete question marks you have to trade for a star player like this. And these guys are young. Debrinkit and Chikrin both, right? They're, what, 25, 24 when you're acquiring them? The only argument I would have is that neither came with a long-term extension. Like, Chikrin has team control for, a, what, two, three years. But if you can't get Debrinkit signed now, then that trade last summer becomes a whole lot more questionable because you're probably getting the same, if not less, value back for him. And then it's it's a big kind of, okay, that might have been a lost, lost deal. Um, Chikrin too. I mean, I think when his time comes, you need to extend him for this to be a good trade, unless you can get a lot more for him. So I think that kind of comes back to being on Dorian. But other than that, yeah, I'm totally on the side that these were big wins. Yeah, I think that last part you said kind of probably fits more in the. We can have a different discussion about the philosophy of trading so many picks, right? And it's not just for to bring it and Chikrin. It's to get rid of Murray and Zaitsev, right? Like. Let's not forget that Pierre Dorian got rid of a lot of valuable draft picks to get rid of players that he signed and made mistakes on, right? So I think that's important to remember when you're discussing the, you know, the philosophy of trading draft picks, trading so many draft picks. Because the way I like to think of it is, and and it goes back to last year's exit meetings, the the infamously, you know, Shabbat and Kachuk going in and telling Dorian like we're tired of draft picks. I think it was more Shabbat than anyone. Um, 
saying like we don't need draft picks anymore. So I think when when they're trading a second and a third round pick to get rid of players on their roster just for free, essentially to Chicago, like we mentioned with Zaitsev and to Toronto with Murray. I don't know how the players would feel about that. They probably don't care, but you, you have to notice it. If you're a player, you have to be like, oh wow, that's uh, you know, that's not ideal. But again, they're not going to be thinking about the player who's drafted with a 2024 second round pick because they're not going to see him in, in five years. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And and again, with the draft capital, like that is important. And, and those bad deals are important because Ottawa has currently five picks in the 2023 draft. They only have two picks before the seventh round, and that's only a fourth and a fifth. And I mean, I don't know who they're going to, I don't think they have a lot of maneuverability when it comes to trades. Like, I don't think they're going to be Unless they move next year's picks and stuff, it's going to be tough to get more picks this year. So, yeah, I mean, it does matter. And again, we've talked about it a little bit, but it's important to have prospects because they're cheap. And if you can get guys who can step in once you're a cap team, which Ottawa is very, very soon going to be, like every contract matters. And having guys in the bottom six, on the bottom pairing, who can be those entry level guys who are cheap is critical. So, you know, you've seen a lot of teams who, who they don't draft well and they can't find guys who are going to kind of be that entry level guy and they're in tough cap situations right because they have to agree to, to bad deals with Barclay Goodrow and and different stuff like that so it is important to draft um I mean capital wise though like after this year they're pretty good right they have their first two two picks in the next uh two drafts they have lots of picks next year I'm not too worried about it this year will be tough but after that yeah I'm not uh, I'm not too worried it's just they can't keep making bad trades they can't keep having to unload Matt Murray's yeah okay and so and this is gonna be a perfect segue actually into our next discussion um, but I'll just leave the chicken thing there for a second because let's say in the event that the Sens tank again next year by accident and don't make the playoffs and all this, like think of all the guys like we just named. If they have to bring it, you're selling him for a first rounder. Chikrin's probably like I obviously I'm not trying to will that into existence because it would be very painful and frustrating. But um, the assets can easily be retained based on the players they have on their roster. Is basically what I'm trying to say. So with that and on that note. With all this new ownership stuff, and I think we were bound to talk about this at some point. We will probably get to the head coach at some point as well. But there's been some chatter on Twitter, I would say, earlier this week about Pierre Dorian deserving to see this team through because of what he's built. Um, and I think it's a great discussion to have. I think there's, I see both sides. Um, so what we mean by this is basically, if you're a new owner coming in and you've had these meetings with Dorian already. Uh, honestly, so they probably have a, something in mind. Um, are you saying, okay, we'll give you five, ten months or whatever to see this this season through, do your tweaks because you built this roster? Or are you saying what you've done isn't good enough, we want playoffs immediately, and we don't think you'll get it done? So that's not really the question. The question isn't are they going to look at him and say that. The question is are they going to look at him and say, does he deserve to see this season through? And it's a bit of a tough one especially with general managers, because you could argue that every year 31 general managers don't deserve their job. So, uh, Brennan, I'll start with you, obviously. What do you think uh, about this prompt? Yeah, I mean, I think I think he'll stay, and I think he should stay. I'm far more under the belief that Dorian should stay than DJ right now. And, yeah, we've talked about it a little bit, but I think we can really kind of dive into it here. Um, Dorian, he has built the team, and I think he's done, aside from having to unload Murray and Zaitsev, He's done a lot of good things, and I mentioned it before that he's done a lot of good things with contracts specifically, um, which is kind of an important thing coming up with the Brinkett and with Chikrin and with Sanderson, and I think if you can keep kind of going on that track that you've been on, you'll be in a good spot. The argument here is if you look around the league at the other GMs, Dorian is the seventh longest tenure GM, and, and the ones in front of him, you've got Doug Armstrong in St. Louis, Kevin Cheveldayoff in Winnipeg, uh, Yermo Kekalainen in Columbus, Jim Neal in Dallas, Brian McLennan in... Uh, Washington or McClellan uh, and then Don Sweeney in Boston so they've all accomplished some pretty significant feats right over their time as GM Dorian since his time as GM they've been to the playoffs in that one year and I mean he took over in April and it's kind of like eh, I don't know how much credit he deserves for that one playoff run they had because he was brand new and didn't really have to do a whole lot um, so yeah I could see the argument where they come in and almost where new owners maybe they don't have the ties back to whenever and they look and they kind of say here are the facts, here are the results that Dorian's produced, and it's like almost all negative, right? Very little playoffs, they've had to tear everything down. Um, There are two sides to it, but yeah, I mean, I think that he'll stay despite the results. I think he's done enough to show that he can, and especially since Melnick's passing, he, he can manage the team, and 
I think, again, it comes back to they need to expand that front office for him. I'd love to see what Pierre Dorian could do under a wider range of opinions. Like, yeah, I need to see what he can do with better scouting departments and better pro scouting assistants. And so, yeah, I'm excited to hear your take on it, but that's what I think. Okay, I'm going to... um. I'm just going to preface this by saying I've been a Dorian guy for a long time. I think I started on Twitter even when I was just starting to tweet a lot about the Sens. Like I had Pierre Dorian supporter in my bio or something like that because I, I respected the process, blah, blah, blah. And those were some rough times. Um, I, look, I, I completely see the merit to him deserving to stay because of what he's built and this core, everything on this team right now. That's everything about them that's set up for future success is because of him. And you can't deny that. And I'm not. Um, my thing is that, you know, like you mentioned, like you want to see him with a better scouting department and a bigger staff and everything. I think what is often forgotten about being a general manager is the managing people aspect of it. And I don't think that Dorian is good at that. And it's not a slight to the way he's done the job on the ice and what the team he's put together. And because that's another discussion, like, Every general manager makes mistakes and every general manager has to fix their own mistakes. The thing with Dorian is he's had so much time to do more, to have more mistakes and to fix them. But in the last 10 months, I've been really obviously very impressed the last, I guess, 12, 11 months or whatever it is um, in the trades he's made and the signings and everything. It was fantastic. I just, I'm, I'm tired of the, um, like the Troy man situation this season. I don't think that got enough light and it kind of just went away. Um, and that to me was just kind of a reminder that Dorian is, is I don't want to say he was out of his depth when he got the job in G as the GM, but he wasn't, he was a scout and that I think it's pretty rare for um, amateur scouts to become general managers or assistant general managers and like climb that fast that quickly. Like he's still relatively young. Amateur scout is notable because he, yeah. he's really struggled with the pro side of things. That's exactly. been his biggest exactly. fault. Right. So listen, and, and, and like, like I said, I respect the rebuild process. I was fed up with this season. I was, I was, I drank the Kool-Aid at the beginning of the year being like, yeah, we'll play meaningful games. Um, but the way the season unfold, I, I was frustrated and I was frustrated, very frustrated in November when he didn't come out and speak and he did. And then he said he backed DJ Smith and then they lost seven in a row after he said that that wasn't good enough for me. I don't think he faces the media well enough. And I, like, there's a lot of stuff that, that, I know like people in, in the Sens media, like the press rooms have problems with the way he handles himself. And you can see it. You can watch the press conferences. It's not a secret. Um, I know our, our Ian Mendez at The Athletic wrote that piece about him kind of saying the same things I am about how long his tenure has been. Um, and, and I read that and I, like, I, I agree completely with Ian because you can just tell the way he kind of goes about it. Like he's got this some certain certain arrogance to him sometimes. And it's not that that's a bad thing. It's just they haven't made the playoffs in six seasons. You can't back that up with this arrogance. Like, yeah, you've done a good job, but you've had seven years to do it. It's a completely unprecedented um, streak, I guess, that he's been on. So that's why I, I put the prompt specifically. Like, I could see him being back. I could see them being like, yeah, there's nothing you could do that can change in the next month that you that you can undo or do that will ruin a playoff push. Um, but I, I personally, I don't think he deserves to see it through. And I. I I understand the sentiment, but um, yeah, like, like that. That's my that's my mini rant about about Dorian there. Like I I would be like it would it would suck a little bit to see him go because I've grown up with him as the general manager of the Sens essentially, right? Like seven years of my life. Um, but I, I think it's time, and I'm just tired of the same message all the time to the fans and to the media. Okay, so let me ask you this then. Let me ask you because I'm I'm on your side. Like I. I would honestly like to just not restart because they're just entering their best window for the players on the ice, but I would be totally fine if they fired Pierre and DJ this summer and just restarted on that front because I just think there's so much work to do off the ice based on what was kind of left after Eugene passed. I will ask you, though, just for the sake of it, because I almost want to make this into a bit of a segment, um, what positives do you see with Dorian? Like, like, if Dorian comes back, what do you think ownership comes in, and why would they make that decision? Like, what positives do they see behind that decision? To to bring him back? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so the main thing for me, and, and I'll give him all the credit in the world, is the contract negotiations. I think, you know, everyone, and myself included, wants Kyle Dubas in, in Ottawa, if if that ends up being the case. Look, lease might be swept, and it might be a thing by the time everyone's listening to this, but um, I, the reason 
that the only knock on Dubas is those contracts. And he signed all of them. Tavares, Marner, or Matthews, Nylander. Uh, you know, he, though, that's the reason they're cap strapped. And that's the reason they struggled so much that in, in any way. So I'll give Dorian tons, tons and tons of credit for the Norris deal. I still think that's going to be a good one. Even like if it's hard when a player gets injured to be like, yeah, it's a bad contract because you know, so, so I'm not going to blame that for Norris. Like I think Norris is a good deal. Batherson was a great deal at the time. He's the best player on the team and he signed for 5 million a year, less than um, Kachuk's a steal. Stutzel's a steal. Like you could argue that Shabbat, like it went, excuse me, if Shabbat plays well, he's a steal. Like, all these guys are are cap controlled for a long time and have been. So that's the one thing, especially with the Brinkett coming up. I, I have faith in Dorian to squeeze the Brinkett to a lower cap hit. I really do. Um, that's about it, though. Like I, I can't really think the drafting. Sure, but if we're going, if you take twenty twenty out of the equation, which is a draft they had months to prepare for it was in october the draft is usually in june it was covid they had nothing to do they just sat there and like there was no hockey going on and just watched film and everything like they were over prepared for 2020 which benefited them and they were way under prepared for 2021 which is we're, we're seeing now right so i'd say drafting maybe but other than that like it's just contracts for me i don't know about you if there's anything else but negotiations for sure yeah, I guess just continuity with the team too. Like he he's been around for so long that he kind of knows exactly where they're lacking and stuff. It just comes back to can he actually make the right acquisitions? Because yeah, you can sign as many players as you want. Like, but these contracts you're talking about, they're not like they're not free agents. They're all drafted players coming off of their ELCs, right? So as much as yeah, he's good on the amateur side because that's what his job was for years was amateur scouting. Um, it's can he now take this team? It's the same with DJ. Can he now take this team to the next level? Because their holes right now generally are not going to be internally filled. Like now you're looking, you need to find someone who can provide you with, and maybe that's uh, the new Czech player, Yuri Smith. <laughs> you know his last name. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. anyways, um, maybe that's him, right? And maybe they made a good signing there. Um, but you need to be able to find like a free agent who can step in now. And I know like Jesper Faust has been rumored a lot and stuff like that, who can step in and actually make a difference. And same with their goalie. Can is that Forsberg and Sogard? Do you have to go trade for somebody, sign somebody, right? Is Pierre the guy who can make the right deal and not end you with another Matt Murray who you're overpaying and stuck with and that screws the entire contention window? Cause you can't really mess up with a goalie like that. You need a goalie and you cannot be wasting years without a goalie. So I mean it just comes back to to that really for me. Um, like you said, yeah, I think contracts are a huge plus. I think continuity with the team and with how long this ownership thing is dragging on. You know, if a new GM comes in with only a couple months before the season, like how much are they going to be able to do and address the team needs? Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean that that's really what it is for me. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add for Dorian, but yeah, you reminded me of something too. Like, I, I, it kind of goes with drafting a little bit, but the culture that's been built. I think I think he tore down a toxic culture um, and built back up a, a formidable one, to be honest, and like deserves tons of credit for that. And that goes a little bit with drafting, I think, like. The Brady Kachuk pick, easy one to not make at the time. I don't think that's that's out there, but you know, like I I completely believe him when he's like, that was we're drafting a future captain. Like that's not that's not a lie, and he has said many false things to the media that has been uh, called out before. But I I believe that one. So like I'll, I'll give him credit on that for sure. Um, even like a guy like Tim Stutzla, I mentioned the 2020 draft, how it was so dragged out. It was COVID. They couldn't meet in person. All this, um, you know, not that. It was a debate taking Stutzel at three, but I I love Stutzel's skill, but I didn't know what kind of person he was. He seems like a great kid. He's just like always a happy, competitive, like just seems like a great person. So like they deserve credit for all of that, drafting and trading for good people um, and putting them in this community where it matters. So I'll give him credit on that and the contract negotiations. But again, like he's had so long to do it. So that's the only thing that um, I take it with a bit of a grain of salt because GMs are, it's rare for, this little play, like he's made the playoffs once and it was a team he inherited, right? With Eric Carlson on one foot. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah, and I think that's the success thing, right? And that's why I listed off the GMs in front of him. And if you look at the teams, right, it's you've got St. Louis, Winnipeg, Columbus. Um, Columbus is an interesting one, actually, that Yermo's lasted so long. But Dallas, Washington, Boston, then behind them, you've got LA, Carolina, Toronto, uh, Tampa. These teams have all achieved a lot of things, right, compared to what Dorian's achieved. And so 
I do think that, you know, his time is coming. And even this season, I mean, I guess if they if they keep Dorian and say DJ two and they make the playoffs this year, I doubt that they're gonna fire them after that. I mean, maybe if they get like swept in the first round or something, but I guess they could extend their lifespans if they manage to live through this summer. Um, at the same time, though, it does kind of feel like their time is coming, right? Like, it, I just don't, when when the Sens are competing for a Stanley Cup, is it going to be Dorian and DJ at the helm? Because to me, it really does not feel like it will be. Like, I'd bet a lot that it will not be, in fact. No, I, I think you're right. But we have to consider this, too. I know DJ is in the last, going into the last season of his contract. And is it the same for Dorian? Are they both just extended until that year? There might be some option for Dorian after this yeah, the I'm next not sure season when Dorian's extended to actually. So let's let's say for DJ especially, like it's rare for I don't know rare. I guess a couple of them happened this season, but coaches don't typically go into a season when there's so much expectation with no future for the next season ahead. Like they don't go in blind. Like and GMs never do it except for Kyle Dubas in Toronto this season. So um I'd be interested to know that because it's not, yeah, are they gonna keep them around? It's are they gonna extend them? Like they gotta they could just both we're talking about coach and GM just walking as free agents now and not just players. Like they could just walk and then you'd be screwed. I'm, I'm obviously tongue in cheek there a little bit, but it's it's something to think about because DJ especially, like I would imagine ownership's gonna come in and be like, Okay, Pierre, look, you're both staying. You can't extend DJ though. We wanna see how this plays out. And I think that's that's completely fair. Um especially it, it makes sense to fire a coach when he's in the last year of his deal for sure it does yeah i mean it, it would make a lot of sense to just at the end of next season say you know the senators and dj smith have decided to mutually part ways so it's not even like a negative thing that happens a lot of the time too it just happened with gallant too actually that they said like we're mutually parting ways it's a nice way of kind of saying you're fired but um that wouldn't be bad because again dj's done a lot of good things and, and he's made a lot of you know a lot of good uh, connections with the players. They spoke about it. I have some quotes lined up we can read off thereafter. But um, everybody loves DJ, and so it would kind of suck to see, you know, he's fired and it kind of ends on bad terms. It would be nice to see just a, a, he's not the next the coach to take them to the next level, and that's it, right? That would kind of be well taken by the community as well. Pierre actually has two years left on his deal, so it's a little different. Um, but yeah, did you want to talk about DJ as well and kind of... Sure. Yeah. Let's uh let's discuss DJ. We don't have I don't have a little headline made for it, but it's okay. We'll just off the cuff here for it's it's more this is more for the Apple podcast and the Spotify podcast people listening on. But um yeah, uh DJ bit different for me. I think I think uh he, he obviously had a interview over in Budapest with Ian Mendez. Again, I mentioned Ian mentioning Ian who's over there covering the tournament and um he, he had some pretty candid comments, honestly, like just about, you know, and, and Ian presented him with the athletic fan survey, the 26% of the fans, only 26% of the fans believe you're the coach of the future. Um, and DJ said, I don't have it verbatim the quote here. I don't know if you've got it, but um, that, that I haven't really been given a playoff team. I'm paraphrasing here, but I haven't been given a playoff team. Um, we haven't been expected to compete, blah, blah, blah. There's some truth to that. Like he's not wrong. I've, I believe in DJ Smith. I think he's a great coach and I think he's going to find success elsewhere. I don't think he's a bum. I don't think he's a bad coach, but good coaches run out of tenure with teams all the time. It happens everywhere all the time. Um, first one off the top of my head is Joel Quenville, obviously different situation, but he was fired in Chicago because he ran out of like wiggle room with that team. He, he got everything he could out of that team. And there's nothing wrong with that. DJ did what he was supposed to do. Like you said, so I don't think that he deserves to be back either. But I would I I think he deserves to be back a bit more than Pierre does, if that makes any sense. And I but I think it makes more sense to keep Pierre and not DJ. If that makes that it might be a little all over the place, but that's my feeling. Yeah, that makes sense. I do have the quote. So it's I've never been given that opportunity to coach what most of the league would say is a playoff hockey team. When I hear people say, but he hasn't made the playoffs in four years, I say, hang on. We weren't supposed to even be close for the first three years. And this past year, we wanted to be close. We were eliminated with three games left. So, like, again, he is right, but there's also been a lot that it's kind of a loser mentality in the sense that people will say, okay, they missed the playoffs by six points and they were right in it until three games left. DJ himself said that. Okay, it is a fact. It is a fact. I mean, they were there. My issue is that I still feel like they could have been better. And I know they had injuries. I know Norris was out, everything else. I just look at the individual games that they lost to Chicago, to Vancouver, to a crumbling Calgary, 
And if they won those games, they would have been in the playoffs. And I know they won games with their goalies out and everything else. But I just look at the individual situations instead of just generalizing, saying they had injuries and stuff. I look at the potential that team had last year, and I still think it was higher. Like, I really do believe it was higher. And even if they didn't make the playoffs, it still felt like there were so many times in which they were right there and could have taken advantage of an opportunity. And they just didn't. Not only that, and I just that five nothing loss to Chicago eats away at me every day of the year because that was the game that just kind of set the tone for the rest of the year. And if they could have just beat that Chicago team, they were right there. And that that was a big kind of uh, a point that stands out to me from the season. Yeah, that's a good point because like it was the Chicago game, and then they had that great comeback or not comeback, but like the the grind win in Seattle, like the five four late goal, like. And then they go in Vancouver and Calgary, like you said. Um, but that's what I was saying, like about Dorian too. Like, yeah, technic. Like I said, I was drinking the Kool Aid, being like, and, and I'm, I'm, it's a reference if if anyone's not <laughs> getting that there. But like, you know, we're buying what they're selling, and that's what we will play meaningful games at the trade deadline. And like, yeah, you sit here at the end of the year, you can say, yeah, we achieved our goal. And Dorian said three times in the media end of press conference, whatever he said, you know, go find the quotes. That's what we said. It's like, yeah, you did, but look at how it happened. Like you mentioned, those losses are inexcusable. Like, that's why I think this regime needs to be torn down, essentially, because how can we trust that Dorian and DJ are going to get it done when they're faced with that next season? I've talked a lot about how they need to be in the top of the Atlantic. What if they're like Florida this year and they're fighting for a last playoff spot? I have, no, I don't have the faith that they can turn it on with it's this just regime. A- the the way they talk both of them it feels like they're saying we were good enough that's yep, my problem yep. it feels like they were saying we were good enough when i feel like they should be saying we could have been better you know we had the opportunity to be better and even though we faced adversity we had the chance to be better and i don't care how many injuries you have you were a thousand times better than that chicago team that you lost five nothing to and arguably the most important game of the season uh, at that point right so to me it just i don't like the way that they kind of have this mentality of we think we've done enough when in reality, like it, it's been far from enough for quite a few years now. So I don't it, know. It, no. And it's a good point because listen, like the, the end of your press conferences get analyzed a lot as they should. It's the last we hear from everyone before the off season, uh, you know, high profile players and coaches and management. I, I think this year more than any in this rebuild, this was, there was a huge disconnect with the players and the coaches and the GM. I think DJ and Dorian were very like, I don't, maybe resting on their laurels isn't the right term, but like, saying like i said we achieved our goal um and dj was more about like you know i've done what i was told to do here blah 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 just kind of job security all that um but the players i'm thinking of brady and and claude Giroux especially being like we're not satisfied like Giroux especially was was pissed off and he wanted to make playoffs and like he like i think maybe even Giroux, because i know at the beginning of the year he said like we're not going to compete for the cup this season like he was very blunt and he was right But I think as the season progressed, he had to see, like, we have a team. And he's looking at the other standings. Like, we went into this year thinking 100 points was what they needed to get because of the season before. All eight East teams had uh, had 100 points. But it took 92 this year. Like, it was a drop-off, and the Sens still didn't meet it. They fell off when it mattered most. So I think the disconnect from the players being like, we're going to be back there next April versus management and coaching saying we achieved our goal is very, very frustrating to me. Um, and I like though that Brady Kachuk owned up to um, the 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 pressure that they felt at the beginning of the year, because that's that's what I want to hear from the captain. Because I know he's going to be here next year. I want him to recognize that they weren't good enough at that time of year, and not just cite yeah the analytics were were in our favor. It's like they just learned about analytics and they're talking about it, being like oh they're good and they were good, but the puck wasn't going in the net, and that's on the GM and the coach to explain why. Yeah, and, and there were the analytics thing. I mean, I love to hear them talk about the analytics, but there is a lot of times too where it does feel like they just kind of looked at the very they just raw talk. numbers they just, and they just, they just like, throw it out. Oh yeah, yeah, our expected you, goals were good. I'd like, like to ask them if they know what that actually means no. in a sense almost because, I don't know, I, there's a lot of back and forth. I find one thing that's lacking in the organization and has been um, under Melnick in general for a long time, but is accountability. I mean... And it goes right to DJ with a lot of the players and kind of one of the the criticism points surrounding DJ is, does he hold people accountable or is he really just that friendly coach, right? Like, would he ever bench the stars like John Cooper did in Tampa? Um, Stuff like that. It just, I don't know, from the top down, it feels like 
the mentality is not where it needs to be to build a winner. And that's why when Ian's article, and it was a good article, and like I'm not saying I don't like DJ as a person. He seems like just such a genuine dude. Andre uh, Tierney of from Arizona, too, really spoke about how he actually said something along the lines of it would be Ottawa's loss if they fire him because he's a, you know, whoever's getting him is going to be really good. I guess another question I would ask is if DJ gets fired because Andre said that, you know, he would get hired for sure somewhere. And I know people have been talking about that. My question is, would he be hired by a contending team or would he be hired by a rebuilder? Because I'm almost certain he would be hired by a rebuilding team. And once again, show that he can develop a young team. But again, is he going to make it to the point where he gets them into the playoffs and is a playoff coach? I don't know. I don't really think so. Yeah. And and I keep mentioning like drinking the, the Kool-Aid, but um, earlier this year, I, I convinced myself that DJ was was the right guy and they can they can, you know, take it further with him. And, and again, like I, I keep saying all this and we're ranting, but I would not be surprised if D, they're both back next season and this team is still tops in, like tops in the Atlantic. Like they it's there. It's right there. They just have to execute. Um, and the coach can't execute for the players. So that's another discussion though. Um, I don't know if a contender would hire him. I think you're right. I think it would more be a, maybe a team that like, I'd be, I'd be surprised if it's a team that's a bit older, maybe that kind of fell off, like, like a Washington, like they need a new coach, right? If, if DJ gets fired soon, I don't know. But, um, as the days go by here, I'm, I'm less and less, uh, you know, thinking that it will happen, but. Um, by the time we actually record next, uh, bids will be due for the team, which is exciting. It'll be um, the 15th when we record. So that's something to look forward to. But anyway, uh, to answer the question, uh, no, I don't think it'll be a contending team. I, I, I honestly, like I said, I think Washington's the only one that pops into my mind um, that would be looking for a, a new voice. But like, I, I don't see New York going after him. Like, I don't know. I, I don't uh, like his, his book is that he brings grit. And, and like a hard playing style um and it really does fit a rebuilding team so maybe in anaheim but they're they're they just fired dallas eakins after they were the dead last team in the nhl so i'm not really sure how about you what do you think yeah i don't think so i think his book is definitely that and again credit to him because he gets a lot out of his young players he seems to really make them believe that that they can be good enough and that they can and I say good enough again because it's not a mentality of you need to be better than good enough. It's just you need to be good enough and play your game. And that's good. It's just a matter of the NHL. If we're talking about the 80s, maybe being physical and being, you know, working hard and stuff, that, that's how you win games and everything. But we're talking about 2023 and skill is really where the game is going. And it's already there. I mean, my God, some of the things these players are doing. Some of the systems these teams are running, just catering to skill, almost avoiding, you know, overexerting energy by throwing hits and finishing your checks. It's almost like the opposite of what a lot of us learn growing up of finish your check. You know, you're going to work hard. You're going to show the other team that you're not going to back down. You're going to be this big, scary force. That's good and all. But every finished check, that's wasted energy. You see it a lot of the time with Brady, even where he'll finish a check. But then for the rest of the shift, he might be a little bit more tired looking. Like It's just that type of thing where it's almost like, you have to find a balance of working hard, being physical, setting the tone in the game, but then also being able to use skill, being able to set up in the offensive zone, being able to pass the puck around, not just dumping and chasing, you know? And I don't know. For DJ, I think he brings a lot of great qualities. I think he could definitely take a Washington, kind of bring in that new voice, that that will of belief, and, and kind of create those positive connections. But again, once they become a contender again, is he going to be there? I, I don't think so. I think he's yeah. kind of... I think that is his role as a coach, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that you have to recognize that, right? And every team will. And 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 just to wrap up here, because we, we we went off on this uh, <laughs> this program, uh, by the way. But um, I think with DJ, it's like he's young. He's still a young coach. I think he's forty five right now. Like that's young for an NHL coach. Um, I I feel like as he gets older, and, and this is kind of a narrative that might be going around. I don't know if it's even it's it's definitely there. There might not be much truth to it, but that. You know, it, it, maybe with older guys, he has trouble holding them accountable, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but it wouldn't surprise me, I guess, just the style he wants people to play. And if you're an older guy, I mean, like, nah, screw that. Um, but yeah, I think he's a coach where as he gets older, he'll only get better. Um, so I, I definitely do think this wasn't, this won't be his last NHL coaching job. Uh, I, I just, like, like you said, I don't think it'll be right away. I think he'll need some time, step away. Um, but you mentioned, the young players and, and propping them up. Like I mentioned New York and saying no, but that's kind of what they need. That's why they got rid of Gallant, it sounds like. So I don't know, maybe there's something there, but 
that would be impressive if it was just a gallant for DJ Smith swap uh, with Ottawa and New York. But um, all right, Brendan, I think I think that's good to wrap up there. We, uh, you know, we, I, I, I know you probably thought the same thing. We might be running short for time, but um, the if you get if you guys talking about Dorian and DJ, as long as they're still here, it'll be a good discussion. So that was a that was a fun one to have, and we thank everyone for joining in on episode six of the Everyday Sense podcast. Reminder to sub to the everydaysends.com website and the YouTube. Sub to the YouTube. Comment, like, please. And uh, we will see you guys next week.